Have you ever been bitten by a tick? If you have, I bet you didn't feel a thing. I bet you didn't know they were there, and, and they do tend to get into places that, yeah, can be a bit embarrassing. <laughs> so ticks are not like insects. They're not like mosquitoes or, 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 or sand flies. They don't have a quick meal. They don't hit you quickly, take a big slurp, go, and then you're left with a, a red lump on your skin, inflammation swelling, itchiness. They really tuck in ticks when they feed. This is an a electron micrograph of a tick feeding in the skin. They really bury their heads into the skin. And, and they may be feeding if you don't find them for quite a few days. So how do they do that? How come you haven't noticed they're there? Well, they do that because because they have some very complicated salivary glands. And in those salivary glands, we can see them if we take the back off a tick. Inside there, we can see these complex grape-like structures, and in particular, these round blobs, these round grape-like structures called acini. And in the electron microscope, we can see in these acini staining them with different chemicals, that they are stuffed with lots of amazing molecules, proteins, peptides, non-peptidic molecules. And this is what we call the ticks pharmacy. So before I tell you my story about the ticks pharmacy and exploring it, I want to just go back in time a little bit and, and say, well, how on earth did I get to this position? Which might seem a bit odd. And it goes back to, this is, paper was published in 1987, it goes back to uh, an experiment um, a PhD student of mine was doing. So we were looking at a virus that was transmitted by ticks. And uh, one of the problems was when you work with ticks that take a long time to feed, you do have to use animals. And we wanted an animal that was not susceptible to this virus because we wanted to look to see if the virus could be transmitted between infected female ticks or infected male ticks, vice versa. So we wanted to see if we could get tra transsexual transmission of this particular virus. And what happened was the experiment seemed to go wrong. So all the controls which should have stayed negative turn positive. So when the ticks fed, 8 to 14 days, all those negative ticks have become positive. <coughs> we call this phenomenon non-viremic transmission. So viremia means virus in the blood. And for these kind of virus, viruses, that, is the, that has been for many, time, many years the dogma that in order to be transmitted by a tick or a mosquito. These viruses must get into the blood. There must be lots of them so that when the virus, when the tick or the mosquito feeds, it takes the blood up with the virus in it. But here we've got so-called non-viremic transmission. So this was published in a very prestigious journal, uh, but nobody believed it. They thought, this is pretty weird. So obviously, we had to find out what, how, they, how, how could this happen? And about the same time, uh, a group in the States were working on leishmania, which is caused by a parasite transmitted by sand flies, and they found that there was something in the sand fly saliva that was helping the leishmania to be transmitted. So we said, okay, let's have a look at the, sal uh, the saliva of these ticks. Uh, we didn't know how to do it, but I had a colleague in, in, in Canada, Ruben Kaufman, who's the world's expert, and still is, on making ticks spit. <laughs> so he came in the lab, and we fed up some ticks, and you can see them all laid out here on their backs on these microscope slides. We put these capillaries over their mouth parts, we stimulated them with a chemical, and then we collected the saliva. And there's a knack in that because they have a horrible habit of spitting out the, the saliva and then sucking it back. So you 
really have to be very careful. So we looked at the saliva, we mixed it with the virus, we repeated the experiments, and hey presto, yes, there's definitely something in the saliva. And that started my research career in trying to understand what these molecules are. And I just want to share with you some of these amazing molecules and uh, convince you that ticks really are amazing creatures. So this is the first molecule we found. Um, it was isolated from this tick, and we, can pro pro we could produce it synthetically. Um, we managed to crystallize it. It's a protein. You can see a crystal at the top right there. That's the dream of every uh, scientist who's looking at protein structures. Get a crystal. We could resolve the atomic detail. And this uh, cartoon here is a cartoon of the atomic detail of this particular molecule. So it's amino acids making up a protein. They're organized in uh, anti-parallel beta sheets. That's these strip-like ribbons. And amazingly, what we saw inside this molecule were two molecules of histamine. You must have heard of histamine. That's the thing that those mosquitoes are releasing that's causing your swelling and inflammation when you're bitten by a, a mosquito. So how does it work? Well, I'll just think again of being pricked by a mosquito or just, just a, a blade, a, 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 a bit of wood. Your finger goes red, it swells. And what's happening is that you're activating cells that contain preformed histamine, things like mast cells. And this histamine, which is shown in this figure as H, um, interacts with receptors on the surface of different white blood cells. And there are at least four different receptors. And by interacting with those receptors, they initiate these processes of constricting the blood vessels, of inflammation, reddening, and bringing in more cells to try and deal with this um, invasion. So what does the tick do? Well, it also causes this degranulation and, and release of histamine. But this histamine binding protein binds up the histamine. And by binding up the histamine, it stops the histamine from, from binding to the receptors. So it stops, it prevents that inflammation, that itching, that swelling. If we think any of you suffer from hay fever or, or have skin problems, you go to the pharmacy to buy antihistamines. There are all sorts of them. There's a drug for every single one of those different receptors. What the tick has done is said, I don't care what those receptors are. I'm designing, I have designed one molecule that deals with histamine. So, there's one molecule from the tick. There's a whole pharmacy from our pharmaceutical industry. So one message, the first message really about ticks is they're pretty smart. <laughs> this um, cartoon is an antibody drug. There are a lot of antibody drugs now on the market. This particular one is the most expensive drug in the world. So it costs just over half a million dollars for one year's treatment. It's for patients with a, an orphan disease, a rare disease, but a hugely expensive drug. Drawn to scale, this molecule here is from a tick. It's produced synthetically. It's nine times smaller than this complicated antibody drug. It does exactly the same thing and more. So the message here is that these drugs from ticks can be highly cost effective. And this one here is a tick anticoagulant. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at those ticks up there, that small one actually is the same as the big one. It's the female, and yes, the females do all the work. So it's the female after she's fed. So the female feeds and increases her body weight about 100 times. Why does she do that? All that blood that she takes in 
is converted into eggs. So the bigger she is, the more eggs she can produce. And now, if that blood was to coagulate, to clot, it would be an awful mess. In fact, the tick would die. So not surprisingly, ticks produce very pow potent, powerful anticoagulants. This is, the, this is the sequence, this is the composition of one of those proteins, which we call a peptide, and we've called it variegin. It's very similar to uh, a drug that's been derived from the leech called hirudin, and is now marketed as bivalirudin or angiomax. This drug is used in heart disease, so for coronary um, stenting, if you have a constriction of coronary arteries, the technique these days is to put a little tube inside that artery to keep it open. It's a non-invasive procedure. It's becoming used increasingly. And obviously, when, those, when that surgery is done, it's very, very important that there's no blood clotting. This drug is used for that purpose. The tick equivalent is 15 times more potent. And it's more potent. One of the reasons it's more potent is that like the leech drug, it targets a protein at the center of the blood coagulation cascade, thrombin. Thrombin is shown here in the crystal structure in yellow. And that crimson ribbon there is the tick protein after it's been cleaved by thrombin. It sits in a little canyon on the surface of the thrombin molecules. And by interacting with the catalytic triad at the heart of this thrombin molecule, it stops it from working. And it stops it as long as this thrombin is around. So it's a, it's a long-acting anticoagulant. And this very mechanism by which it works has taught us something new about controlling anticoagulation. So that's really the third message about these ticks. They're teaching us new tricks. Recently, we've heard in the news a lot about immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is having some fantastic results in cancer treatment. It may well be uh, a way of uh, not needing chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Well, ticks are already there. They produce uh, an immunomodulator. This is the molecule. It likes to work in pairs. And when we got the crystal structure of this one, we found to our surprise that buried in the heart of the molecule was one molecule of cholesterol. Why is this immunomodulator carrying cholesterol? really don't know. We're really scratching our heads about this one. If anyone has any ideas, <laughs> I'm really interested to know. But I'm sure once we've worked it out, we will discover yet something else that's new. So nature um, inspires us in many ways. Usually, you know, it's a wonderful painting. Um, it's a walk in the park. Uh, it's not usual that creatures like these that suck blood inspire us. But what I'd like you to do next time you're bitten by a tick is just to pause a moment and think to yourself, what a clever little tick you are. 